I'd like all of us to think about science and its methods and tools. Space time. The nature of human consciousness. Artificial intelligence. Incredibly realistic humanoid robots. The new technology for gene editing. The battle against climate change. Future civilization, Mars, Moon, wherever we're going to go. A laser highway, a laser beam shooting the consciousness of aliens at the speed of light. What? Dude. Get smarter faster with new Big Think videos daily from the world's most brilliant minds. Welcome everyone to today's Big Think webinar. I'm Victoria Montgomery Brown and I will be moderating the discussion today. Today's topic is Who's Hiring Now? The Crisis Playbook for Leaders and Job Seekers. Our guest today is James Citrin. Jim is a noted expert on leadership, executive success, and CEO succession. He's the author of many acclaimed and best-selling books, including The Career Playbook, You're in Charge, Now What?, and The Five Patterns of Extraordinary Careers. He's one of the foremost executive recruiters and leads Spencer Stewart's North American CEO practice. We'll start with a discussion with Jim, and then we'll open it up to audience Q&A. Um, you can fill in questions in the comment box on whatever platform you're looking at, and you can start immediately and we'll get them to the Q&A. Um, at the very end, we'll do an exclusive lesson for our Big Think Edge subscribers, so stay tuned for that. And if you're not a Big Think Edge subscriber, please go to bigthinkedge.com. Okay, so let's get started. Thank you for being here, Jim. Pleasure, Victoria. Happy to be here. Thanks. Um, so from a business leader's perspective, what about this time right now is different? We all know that the world is changed right now and it happens so fast and so suddenly. I've lived through in my business career two or three of the other crises from the dot-com crash and 9-11 to uh, the financial crisis. This one is different because it's the combination of uh, a dr drastic and dramatic economic uh, downturn, recession, depression, with a terrifying global health crisis at the same time. So I think it's woken up everybody to really focus on what's important on all the, on all the levels. And so I think that uh, there's a, it's a very popular conversation right now, leadership in the time of crisis, but here we are. And this is a time when people can really step up as CEOs or as frontline health workers or as individual contributors, no matter where you are. And so do you have examples of what success in leading through a crisis could look like? Well, for sure. I mean, at Spencer Stewart, we're working with corporations, not-for-profits, uh, organizations going through, and I see many, many examples uh, of leaders stepping up I'll talk at, at uh, mention some kind of CEOs and all that, but I think a really important principle is that you do not have to be a CEO to be a leader at any time, but particularly now in taking care of people around you who you care about, uh, and, and, and anybody can do that, and you don't have to be a manager to be doing that uh, as well. Um, but I, I, one of the companies that, uh, uh, I work with lots of different companies, but one, one that I'm particularly inspired by is Starbucks. And Kevin Johnston is the CEO. He's an incredible guy, very passionate leader, brilliant, technologically savvy and global. He, because of Starbucks' unique global footprint, they saw this coming really at the turn of the year and started taking crisis actions in January by shutting down all of their stores in China in the first or second week in January. And they, they, they're very focused on the health and welfare of their employees, which they call Starbucks partners. And the Starbucks partners then rally around and take care of customers. But they had rolling ways of closures and then uh, how that worked that its way around the world. But one of the things that we'll talk about is how, how a leader communicates uh, in a crisis. Communications is always essential but never more important than during a crisis. And, um, and Kevin has been doing daily uh, communications on a global basis. And we'll talk about how others have done great communications to strike the right tone and be realistic in what they're saying, but also having a not uh, 
not unrealistic sense of optimism, but finding ways to help keep people focused and, and moving forward. So anyway, Kevin, Kevin's one, one good example, and we can mention uh, uh, several others if you'd like. Yeah, I think you had mentioned Barry Sternlitz. I'd love to know a little bit about who he is and what, what he yeah. did. Well, there's a principle that is an enduring principle of leadership. It's been around forever. And it's a very simple concept, but again, it's never more important than today in a crisis situation. That's the idea of leadership by example. Any parent knows that, you know, your kids pay attention to what you do more than what you say. It's the same with a manager or it's the same with a CEO. Leadership by example is essential. Again, it's an enduring trait. But right now, how people behave in times of crisis, they, they, it speaks volumes. So one of the great examples of leadership by example is by Barry Sternlicht. So Barry Sternlicht is a legend in the hotel and hospitality industry. He was a real estate entrepreneur, brilliant deal guy, and, and he created Starwood Hotels back in the early 90s and built a conglomerate of Starwood for, by a by founding some lines and acquiring Sheridan and building Starwood. And he was the, uh, the creator of the W Hotel and the whole concept of boutique hotels. Starwood's now a part of Marriott. Several years ago, he, uh, he created a new line of hotels called the One Hotels, and there are several. One of the things that Barry did that I was personally blown away by, and it's so brilliant example of uh, a, a case of leadership by example is he he created a starwood employee cares fund because like many many hospitality companies many airline companies they've had to furlough or lay off or put out uh, many of their workers um, and so that's that's fine and trying to do that in, in the best way possible but what Barry and his team did in creating the Starwood Cares Employee Relief Fund was two or three things. And he thought at a very architectural level, really clever. First of all, they raised money for uh, the benefit of their employees. That's fine, but many, many companies are doing that. But not only did he do that through kind of the company funds, but he went out to all the guests and the visitors who have experienced their hotels, the one hotels, and they actually sent this beautiful um, uh, note to them and encouraged people, sort of like a GoFundMe kind of situation. If you've experienced hotels, it's because of the, of the quality of our workers and, for, and then could donate any amount. But then what Barry did is leading by example, he said he will personally pledge to match dollar for dollar all the funds. So he also seeded the funds with a huge amount of money with the leadership team, but then created this challenge. And um, I think that really inspired me and many guests of, of that whole hotel chain to, uh, to give, and then he's doing it as well. So people really see that, uh, again, a, a, in a leadership by example way. So that was a real, a real, Good one, and uh, I was very proud of him. And he happens to be a personal friend of mine, but I was, I was just blown away by the thoughtfulness of this. And I haven't seen any other company do it quite this way either. That's great. So that's an example of leadership and leading by example, especially in this time. So, how do you think leadership will change after COVID? Well, it's interesting, uh, Victoria, one of the things that we study here at Spencer Stewart is what boards are looking for in their CEOs and different, different, uh, different times and circumstances call for different either styles of leadership or different emphases. Uh, many times it's about growth and innovation and product development. Other times it's about restructuring and, and taking costs out and, uh, and, other, and others. I think right now what we're seeing is that the winners in this situation uh, are going to be those leaders who do three things. Number one is with demand in many sectors really going down and revenues going down, it's a, it's a leader's responsibility to help the fiscal and economic health of the organization. So, they, that in, inevitably means taking costs out, 
reducing costs. But rather than just reducing costs ac across the board, the best leaders and the winners out of this will do two things. They will take costs out in a way that restructures operations uh, uh, sort of strategically and will allow them to be more efficient and have much better, more uh, attractive business models coming out. So rather than again across the board cuts, they'll be saying how can we streamline our business model. At the same time, all the research shows that in prior recessions, the winners coming out of the recessions didn't just reduce costs, but they actually made select investments. They invested in things now that when we get on the other side, starts accelerating performance. So whether it's new products or marketing or R&D. So it's this combination of restructuring business model cost reduction on the one hand with selective, selective investments on the other side. But then I think third is wrapping that around in the purpose. I think it's pretty, okay, I'm sure that uh, audience and the big think are very purpose driven folks. And I think that the, the role of purpose and mission in, in companies has never been more important than it was even before this crisis. But I think it's going to be that much more important coming out. So being kind of left brain about the restructuring and highly strategic about the investments but then really right brain and with your heart and soul, really tapping into what matters to people. I think one of the silver linings in this crisis is that it really has been a massive reset for the whole world about what's important, safety, groceries, family, friends, health, uh, getting a little out of the, the social media nuttiness and the 24 seven busyness into the more fundamental thing. And I think related to that, leaders are going to tap into that coming out on the other side as well. So as you pointed out, leadership goes far beyond business. And you recently wrote an article about the queen I'd love on LinkedIn. And I'd love for you to yep. talk a little bit about what you said in that article and why she can, we can learn from her as a leader. Yeah. Well, it's actually very opportune because it happens to be the queen's 94th birthday today. And, um, she, she, she created, for any of you who are uh, fans of the great television show, The Crown, uh, you will know that she was an innovator. She's always been an innovator. And she did a first televised speech uh, at Christmas. I think it was 1957 or something, or way ahead of, uh, ahead of the, uh, the, the uh, uh, just in advance of her time. But only four times in her record setting 68 year old, 68 year reign, has she ever done a televised speech about what's going on? She did a famous one in World War II about the challenges of all the British families, particularly those in London who had to send their children outside of London for safety during the air raids uh, from, the, from the Luftwaffe. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, she came on and this was happened to be the day that Prime Minister Boris Johnson was hospitalized. Terrifying time for the British people. But again, only the fourth time she came out and she did a communication that was so incredibly effective. And I'd urge everybody to look. It was only a four minute speech. But what it did is it had, like any great communication, it acknowledged and it addressed the reality of the situation. It didn't try and sugarcoat it. These are difficult times. But then it also had a lot of compassion about that. We're all in it together. And then it gave kind of a higher purpose of calling for the sacrifice. And then it ended with this beautiful, particularly for then a 93 year old, now a today a 94 year old queen who is beloved in her country and around the world. She basically closed it, said, we will be together again. We will meet again. So it ended on a very uplifting tone. And just like with the Barry Sternlich case of leadership by example, it was a beautiful case of leadership by example, but also communications in a crisis. And I think that's another attribute that all organizations are looking for their, and all governments, by the way, are looking for their leaders to be there in a time that people need to hear what's going on and how co people communicate clearly. And when we pivot in, in this conversation to actually, for those of you who are thinking about your own careers and interviewing for jobs, that idea of communicating has never been more important than it is today, but we can all look for the queen for inspiration. And so just to expand on that, she's obviously at the pinnacle um, in the world. And 
So how would I, as just a regular person, communicate in an empathetic and effective way during these times? I mean, I'm sure we're all, again, at, at our family level, with our friends, we're all getting information all the time, again, either, either in our private world or in our organizations, uh, everybody is sort of saying, what are you experiencing? What's going on? Um, and finding the right, uh, the right balance of being as fact-based as you can. Again, if you're in a position of authority or if you're in a position of responsibility, it's your, you really have to be authentic. You always have to be authentic, but never more important than now. And try and say, look, here's what we're going through. Not over-promising and painting too rosy a picture, but not being just a depressing uh, downer either, but finding that right balance to be realistic, but also be uh, as hopeful as, as possible. Um, so I think that's that's a really important uh, uh, aspect of, uh, of, how to, of how to communicate and the importance of it. Again, I'm sure for many parents who are listening, you're, you're dealing, whether it's young kids or or, or even older kids, you know, they're looking to for your direction and for your leadership, and you're looking to your organization leaders and health leaders and government leaders. Everybody's looking, and they're looking for inspiration. They look around the world to say, well, what's happened in China and what's happening in Italy, and trying to bring those lessons. But there's never been a more important time than to synthesize information, have a point of view, but do it from the heart uh, as well in a very authentic way. So, so many businesses today are going through really hard times, but exuding fear isn't going to help. Obviously, staying in business, if at all possible, is the objective. So, how would you suggest businesses be communicating to their customers and even their shareholders in an effective way that doesn't cause panic? I, I think that uh, I've, I've been really impressed with the way most organizations are communicating. And I see this from the gigantic companies. I mean, if you look at what Amazon, Walmart, and Kroger, and Target are doing in, in, in theirs, or if you even look at many of the early stage companies or the startups that many of us experience, you know, on Instagram or, or through social media, I think, I think it's very clear. And I think everybody's paying attention to everybody else, but which is first caring for the health and safety of their, their members of their organization or their community, and then trying to do right by all their stakeholders. I think starting with the health and welfare of employees is, is obviously the, the, the place to start. And I see that uh, across the board. I also see examples of, uh, of companies, and I see the airlines and the hospitality companies and, and others basically saying, look, we know these are very, very difficult times. Here, we're here to serve, here's what we're doing. Here are the safety protocols that we're putting in place. And then also being very uh, thoughtful about the economic relationships, whether it's deferring, you know, no fee changes or deferrals or cancellations. I've had one, uh, I've seen one organization basically say that for 2021, they're going to allow someone to defer their year subscription into the year 2022. So being very thoughtful about that and probably doing it from an attitude of how you treat people today in the crisis will be remembered long after the crisis. So again, that idea of kind of leadership by example, but just doing right by people, I think is never gonna be more important than it is right now. So I'm going to ask one more question on leadership and then turn to hiring and jobs. So okay. the, the, the kind of normalcy of the charismatic leader may not be um, as important post COVID, especially because in-person meetings may not be as frequent. How do you think about the characteristics of the successful leader post this crisis? Look, I've always been a believer, and I've, I've studied this, I've written some books on this, that the styles of leadership can be across the board. They always have been, and they always will be. Uh, someone can be a charismatic person and really get people fired up, but actually be a lousy leader by not doing right by people or not having smart st strategies or not executing well. They can just be charismatic. I've also seen extraordinarily introverted individuals be quietly inspirational and really decisive thought leaders and people leaders with a different style. So I don't think the style is the thing to focus on. I do think that the fundamentals of 
being a thought leader, being a people leader, helping care for people and creating strategies that are going to win, as I said, sort of this uh, with the restructuring in a smart way, with the investing going forward, wrapped around a, a, a sense of caring and authenticity. Um, there'll be changes. As I said, I think that some companies now that were focused on how do they grow and, and continue to innovate with new products and markets, that emphasis, at least over the next year or two, is more likely going to be focused on how do we keep operationally excellent? How do we be efficient and manage our resources? So a little more perhaps operational than strategic, but that's just a slight shift. I don't think that's going to be a fundamental change, but I do think that, again, I think these are kind of times that, uh, that leaders are forged, and I think everybody has an opportunity to step up. That's great. So now just turning to jobs, what kind of jobs do you think are thriving and will continue to thrive in this environment? Well, I, I think that um, I think that that they're, they're kind of two things. Uh, one is things that are essential. And I don't mean necessarily just the essential what are considered essential businesses. Uh, in by, by our governments and all that, although those are a good place to look for where the growth areas are going to be. I'll come to that in a moment. But essential roles. Um, and when a company has a leadership need, they have a leadership need and companies and organizations need to be led. And we at Spencer Stewart are continuing to do a lot of work with clients on CEO searches, CEO succession planning and other C-suite positions. And, and there's one, you know, I'll just say it publicly because it was announced, uh, it was announced a week ago today. We led the CEO search for eBay at a time while it was planned and it was going, going through, but the whole last month of that search process happened virtually. And it was an extraordinary act of courage by the board to go forward with that and, uh, and complete that uh, appointment uh, at a time when many of the board hadn't met the, uh, the uh, the new CEO who starts next Monday uh, in person, and so there are going to be some interview tips, you know, that you know CEOs and CEO candidates, but also entry level uh, have that we'll we'll talk about in in a few moments. But in any case, essential jobs that that organizations can't live without, they'll continue to go forward. But then the second category is in sectors that are thriving in this business and are going to be likely well positioned coming out of this. Some of these are the obvious ones, healthcare, broadly speaking, and you just have to have your hats off to the healthcare, obviously the frontline workers and, and the doctors and nurses and, and aides that are, that are out there every day, but the teams behind them that are creating the systems and the, the delivery to make that happen, uh, hats off to them and that's gonna continue to be a growth area. All the scientists and uh, you know it was cybersecurity several years ago it was a massive growth area. You know immunology and virology and uh, epidemiology. That's obviously going to be a huge growth area going forward. Um, not only that, obviously the infrastructure. You know I'm, uh, one of the companies that I've been massively uh, inspired by is Verizon here uh, in the states. You know they have 150 million or so customers the volumes of, of communications and transactions that have happened over their state-of-the-art network is just extraordinary. I heard some of the, their CEOs, a wonderful, inspiring leader named Hans Vestberg, and he, he shared with me some of the, the volumes that, like the, the call volumes, the telephone call volumes on a typical day, they're like 10x what they were, and they're, uh, they're as large as what like Mother's Day is, which I think is the typic, the highest, call day in, in the United States, or the text volume uh, has reached what is typically done on New Year's Eve, and that, that infrastructure is handling a lot of the communications and the services that are allowing these kinds of communications and many people who have the opportunity to work from home to do that. Um, so the infrastructure and technology and direct to, the whole direct-to-consumer world is another sector. But there are also some less obvious ones. I was talking to a brilliant investor the other day saying, okay, what do you see from a growth point of view coming out of this? And he said, anything having to do with the home. 
I think people are rediscovering the importance of home and hearth and things, obviously the Home Depots and, and Walmarts of the world, but even like home decorating coming on the other side. But here was something that I thought was brilliant. Again, it's just a hypothesis, but retooling. So are people gonna wanna go to the movie theaters or sports stadiums before uh, coming out of this? Yes, at some point, but the densities that have defined that and a lot of the economic models that are, uh, that are based on densities, a lot of these movie theaters and restaurants and others, they're gonna have to restructure their physical spaces. So people who are doing anything involved with kind of this building or reconstruction or, or retooling, that's an unexpected area. So obviously from a career management point of view, growth creates opportunity. In a constraining uh, sector or, or company, there are fewer and fewer opportunities and more competition for those fewer opportunities. But in growth categories, there are more opportunities. And so that's obviously where you wanna uh, try and focus. And then what type of roles do you think may vanish altogether after um, we come through this? I, I don't really have anything, Victoria, off, off the top of my head that's going to vanish completely. You know, and there'll be certain things that uh, that that are associated with the way things have always been done. But but I don't I don't have any uh, brilliant ideas about what 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 roles are are vanishing completely. Well, so now we're going to turn towards our audience questions. Um, so let me ask you the first one. Um, which is how can employees use this crisis as an opportunity to build their resumes? Yeah. Uh, well, I think, I think this is a gift of time. It's terrifying if you happen to be either working and kind of underemployed or not working and, and looking for something. And it is, it is scary, especially in a contracting uh, uh, economy. So I would, if you are in the, in the latter case of looking for something, really focusing on pivoting to those areas that are that are growing. And there are still companies and organizations that are hiring. There's gonna be more competition for those. So there's gonna be really a premium on how you go about that process. Uh, but I think there's another opportunity of uh, taking advantage of the time and capacity that you may have to benefit from training or pivoting. I mean, I want, I've got, three kids and uh, one of one of them is uh, was was furloughed from his uh, from his company and he's been doing code academy learning how to do computer coding while interviewing all by video by the way um, I, I also uh, worked with I'm working with uh, a number of companies one of the chief HR officers uh, of a 35 billion dollar company said Jim do you have any ideas we have we're trying to to really uh, maintain our uh, workforce, which we worked so hard to build. And we're having some uh, pockets where there's a lot of capacity and what can we do to use that? And I actually introduced the chief HR officer to the CEO of an incredible company called Instride, which is the leading uh, online education company that partners universities who do degree granting education with employers who are looking to, and it's, I mentioned Starbucks earlier, Starbucks have done this with Arizona State University and this company Instride facilitated that. So as an individual, you know, whether it's Coursera or uh, online offerings or free things from, uh, that, are, that are done or even degree program, that, that's a really big opportunity to upgrade your skills, get some credentials, and then help move move forward. And this is another audience question. So are there opportunities the everyday employee should be looking for, whether they're already in an organization and fear being um, furloughed or do no, no longer have a role? Well, the, the most, the, the best, you can do to protect yourself uh, in general, but again, in time of now is to be essential. And how do you be essential? That's really by doing two things. It's by adding a lot of value and being clever. No, no one knows your job better than yourself. And rather than just kind of doing the same thing and running faster, 
really have the impetus to try and say, how can I actually add more value? How can I add, whether it's value that results in revenue to your organization, or at least value that is uh, fundamentally improving things. In fact, um, at Victoria, at the top, when you introduced me, you, you mentioned one of the books that I wrote. Uh, it was called The Five Patterns of Extraordinary Careers. And we did a huge amount of analysis of what differentiated the top kind of top 10% of performers in organizations from everybody else. And there were five patterns. One, by the way, was leadership by example, which I talked about. But another was something I called the uh, the 80, sorry, the 2080 rule. And people know that, you know, typically the 80-20 rule, that 80% of outcomes happen from 20% of the inputs. But we, what we found is a strange and really unexpected pattern that if you actually look at what differentiates people, they do their jobs well. So they do what's asked of them, but rather than just doing more of the same, the top of the top, do they, they, they do their jobs, but they invent 20% of capacity to do things that no one else asked them to do. Their bosses didn't ask them to do. They reinvented their jobs in a way. And actually at an institutional level, Google famously created the 20% discretionary time and they institutionalized that asking employees to say, you've got one day of the week where it's up to you to invent something that adds value. And I found many examples of how you can do that right now. So thinking while you have a little time to say, hmm, how can I add more value to my in internal team or my client base or my customers? What, can, what new service can we come up with? What new communication? What thought leadership can we, can we share? People won't ask you, so be self-motivated on that. And don't just do more of the same. Do what you need to continue that, but say, how? Just ask yourself the question, how can I add more value more creatively? So this is a double-barreled question. Um, for those of us who are lucky to still be employed, should we stay put in our jobs or is now a good time to transition to a new field? Uh, the obvious answer is it depends. Uh, if you are still employed, uh, that's good. You want to appreciate that. Um, but you also don't want to be stagnating. And just as I was explaining a moment ago, to the extent that the organization is continuing to challenge you and you're contributing and, and growing, that's great. You also want to be, you know, you, you don't, it's tough out there. It's really, it's, it's going to be tough these next few months to, to find something. The competition for these open opportunities is going to be greater than it was before the crisis. So I would be, I would be very cautious about that. But before I would leave something that you're in, I would say about, what can I do? What can I do to create more value in the job that make it more interesting and make it more growing? Or if you find that you have like, there's just not much going on, then I would also go back and say, what skills can I develop? What projects can I concept consist of? But by the way, even though there are fewer opportunities, still, if you are currently working, employers are going to tend to uh, give you a premium for that or value you a little higher that you'd be leaving a uh, current situation to join them. So you are doing that from a position of strength. But I would be very uh, extra appreciative of, uh, of having a role right now. And I do think it's incumbent on all of us to use the time to add more value. So have, uh, having an inside window into the recruiting landscape in a way, um, one of our viewers wants to know if you have a sense of when companies will start hiring again and what currently the recruiting landscape is like now. Um, I, I think that um, there are really two, uh, there are two drivers of uh, big recruiting decisions. Uh, and uh, one tends to be a skill set that helps people, helps organizations deal with things changing right now. And right now, there'll be uh, 
there'll be general skills looking for how to help organizations deal with the current crisis. So whether it's on the financial front, restructuring and thoughtful restructuring, or whether it's on the technology front to help uh, transition to more uh, direct to consumer or direct direct kinds of, of businesses. But the second will be when things come out, and this might be a little lagging, uh, when companies start having the confidence to uh, to hire again, what the skill sets are going to be coming out of this out of this crisis. Um, as I said a moment ago, or a couple of minutes ago, rather, um, the essential roles will will continue. And um, you know, one of the big themes again at the very top of organizations that 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 companies and boards are doing now more seriously than ever before, and it's sort of it's a uh, it's absolutely essential is emergency succession planning. Uh, typically in the United States, about 10 to 12 percent of CEOs of large companies turn over each year. So in the S&P 500, uh, that's about 50 to 60 new CEOs are appointed each year. And most companies know that they need to have a succession plan. But right now, most companies and clients we're working with here at Spencer Stewart, they're now saying, you know what, it's not just the CEO, but it's the entire C-suite that needs succession plans and emergency successors. So what process do we need to go through right now? So if you can be uh, one of these essential players or one of the skills that help organizations deal with things right now or later as things start to hopefully come back out, uh, one of the growth kind of skill sets that'll be very helpful as well. And there'll be certain very specific things like uh, technology product managers that see things and then help organizations build things and market things and, uh, and God, obviously the, the whole health sector as I mentioned before. So this is a very specific question. Um, what should job seekers do when companies don't respond to their application especially during these uncertain times? Um, one of the most frustrating things in the world, and I've seen this and I see it with, with, with my kids and young people who I advise, and um, is you know, trying to uh, apply for jobs through web portals and uh, career sites on, on companies, uh, companies' own career pages. Obviously, you have to do that, but for every opening, uh, there might be hundreds, if not thousands, of, uh, of applicants, and many companies just do a bad job. They can't keep up. They don't have the, the person power to respond to everything, and, and it's that black hole. Um, so you, you kind of have to do that. But I, I also think that uh, the old principle of, uh, of trying to find a, a warm introduction or referral is never more important than right now. So if you can say, if you can apply to something and then be very creative to say, who could you, if not, who do you know, who do you know, who might know someone who might know someone in that organization and using LinkedIn very cleverly using your, if you went to college or university, using your alumni directories to say, and to search who might have currently be working for or might know someone use your family and your friends and, and be very transparent about, oh, I'm looking at this organization. Do you know anybody? And they say, hmm, no, but I, my sister-in-law, I think she works in the home improvement sector, so she might know somebody. And if you can then ask somebody to say, here's a great way to ask for help, by the way. You ask for someone to say, I've just applied for a role as an assistant product manager at Etsy. I'm just making this up. And you found a friend of a friend who knows someone who works at Etsy. And then you send them that application or the link to that. And then they send that to the person and say, oh, uh, Victoria, a friend of my son's, uh, she's applied for the assistant product manager role at, at, at Etsy. And I've spoken with her and she's really great. That dynamic that I just described dr dramatically improves your odds of getting, getting seen and getting interacted with. No one's going to hire someone who they don't believe in. Favors really don't really work, but to get someone that goes with a, a warm recommendation along with an actual application is worth 10x just doing it in.
because a, a lot of times, unfortunately, people feel like they're just sending things into a black hole and never hear back, or at best, they'll get an automated rejection, and nothing's more frustrating. So this is the last question for the um, public broadcast. You had mentioned that now is a good time to learn new skills, and you've spoken about Code Academy. Do you have other suggestions of what people might be doing to improve um, their attractiveness, so to speak, in the job markets? I, sure, I, I, but I would link by what you're interested in. Um, if you're interested in the home area and knowing that that might be a growth area, maybe taking a, a home design course and being fluent in that or, you know, some of the, um, kind of if you're interested in, in healthcare as a growth area, there's a, a whole infinite universe there. Find, uh, find some courses or do lots of reading on, on that. Um, I would be I, I I would be really driven by a, a confluence of where the opportunities are likely to be, but also where your personal interests are, and that'll propel you to learn. And then finding ways to get up that that learning curve, and then that can lead to the opportunities. That's great. So thank you so much, Jim. This is uh, concludes the public portion of the webinar for our Facebook and YouTube viewers. Uh, tomorrow, we have Lisa New, Harvard uh, Professor of American Literature at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, and now we're going to, for our Big Think Edge subscribers, get into the exclusive lesson with Jim. Mm -hmm.